Dr. Preeti Tomar and in today's video I am going to give you some important surgical pearls that are to be kept in mind while doing phaco emulsification in a case of posterior polar cataract. This is a 34 year old patient who had presented with complaints of diminution of vision in myopathy and was advised cataract surgery. The important point to remember while filling the interior chamber with viscodispersive OVD is to keep the interior chamber underfilled in a case of posterior polar cataract so that the pressure in the eye does not rise and the eye remains soft. I am here aiming for a 5 mm excess, being mindful of the untoward mishappening of posterior capsular tear and the need of a good sulcus support and optic capture for the intraocular lens in those circumstances. A 2.2 incision is made. The surgical principles to be remembered in such cases are low flow, low pressure dynamics in your FACO machine. As you know, hydro dissection is contraindicated in posterior polar cataracts, so we go ahead with gentle hydro delineation. Here I am trying to confirm the right plane. Now it's time to emulsify the endonucleus. Being a soft cataract, the nucleus management of such case is not an issue. I begin with the trench and I am going to divide the endonucleus layer by layer making sure not to disturb the central posterior polar disc. And as I mentioned earlier, my surgical parameters are kept on lower side. We all know that bottle height determines the pressure inside the eye, hence it is kept as low as 45 to 50 centimeters, so as to minimize the pressure inside the interior chamber. The longitudinal power also is around 40% in this case, vacuum of about 200 to 300 millimeters of mercury and aspiration flow rate of 20 ml per minute. Once I have an adequate depth of the trench, I engage one side of the endonucleus onto the phaco probe and on low power itself, the nuclear fragments are impaled and emulsified subsequently. The sub-incisional nuclear cortical sheet is difficult to aspirate, so I decide on viscodissection. But before coming out, I inject helon in this case to ensure that interior chamber does not collapse. I then dissect out the remaining nucleus and epinuclear sheet with gentle manipulation and the loosened lens matter is then aspirated easily. After taking away the cushion of the nucleus, I move on to irrigation and aspiration. Stripping of epicortex is done from periphery to center to avoid the dehiscence of posterior capsule in the center. The aspiration is to be done in a controlled manner making sure to maintain the interior chamber pressure and to avoid sudden fluctuations of intraocular pressure. We can also use intraoperative optical coherence tomography at this step to see the status of posterior capsule. Halfway along the aspiration, I notice a hint of an underlying capsular tear. At this stage, it's difficult to assess the entire extent, but it's a warning sign of capsule giving away. So as I was saying, there are four types of PPC based on intraoperative OCT. The type 1 PPC shows a clear delineated posterior capsule. There is a hypoechoic clear space between opacity and the capsule. In type 2, there is inability to delineate posterior capsule in the center, which means that there is a dense central opacity adherent to posterior capsule. 
In type 3 PPC, there is inability to delineate posterior capsule along entirety of the opacity. And type 3 is the one which has the most common tendency to have posterior capsular tear. PPC type 4 is an open capsule. Irrigation and aspiration is a critical step and we have to be vigilant and keep our patients during the process. As I continue to aspirate the remaining cortical matter, I see the defect opening up and a large posterior capsular tear is staring at me. Injecting some viscodispersive from the second port to provide some tamponade on the tear, I come out of the bag. I then ask my nursing assistant for vitrectomy cutter and go ahead with anterior vitrectomy. I first use cut IA mode with cut rate of 2000 per minute to cut the vitreous in the AC and at the area of capsular tear. After successfully completing the vitrectomy, I then switch to IA cut mode to aspirate the remaining subincisional cortical sheet. Once the bag is free of all the cortical fibers, I inject viscocohesive between the iris and anterior capsule to form an edicus space that is our sulcus which makes it easier to implant the multi-piece IOL. While IOL implantation, the leading haptic should be aimed towards the sulcus and not downward. Once the leading haptic is in place, it's easier to rotate the trailing haptic. After the sulcus fixation of the lens, the edges of the lens are tucked in below the recess margin. This is known as optic capture. This makes the intraocular lens more stable. After that, I again do the vitrectomy in IO mode to remove the viscoelastic and do a vitrectomy in circular fashion all over the pupillary margin in order to cut any vitreous stand which is coming up to the wound. It's very important to suture the main wound in posterior capsular tear, after injecting the air bubble into the AC, I take a bite through 75% depth of corneal stroma on one side and two-third depth on scleral side and lock the suture and tie the knot in 2-1-1 fashion. After your suturing, don't forget to bury the knot. So the case is completed. Thanks for watching.